how we conceptualize uh, pri the primary prevention of, of sexual assault. And I'll say a lot more about what I mean by that in a moment. Um, but just by way of a little bit more introduction of, I think, how we, how we came to this particular webinar today, um, in addition to, to being a gender-based violence prevention researcher, I'm also on a team of folks that um, works with local programs here in Washington State who receive RPE funds from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to implement sexual assault prevention programming in their communities. Um, and as part of that work, the Washington State Department of Health um, asked our team to do a survey of recent research about risk and protective factors, kind of as one aspect of thinking carefully about prevention programming in our communities um, and across the state as a whole. And folks at WICSAP were consultants in that process. Um, so um, part of what I'm going to share with you today are findings from that kind of survey of what research evidence has recently said about risk and protective factors. Um, in a second here, I'll, I'll share kind of our agenda and our, our roadmap, but I just want to echo what, what Darren has said. Um, please feel free to jump in with questions as we go. Um, I'm a kind of dubious multitasker, so if I miss a question, um, Darren will help me pull my attention back to it. I also hope that you will um, participate in the webinars um, and share your expertise as well. I know webinars are a challenging format for that, um, but the chat function will be live the whole time. And, and certainly we're going to be drawing on some research evidence here. And research evidence is one way of building knowledge about sexual assault prevention, and, um, but it's certainly not the only way. And you all have a lot of uh, exposure to and, and experience with research and with your local communities, and I hope that you will share your, your wisdom and your expertise about what you've seen in terms of risk and protective factors and how you address those in your primary prevention programming in your communities. So um, it would actually really help me to start off by hearing a little bit from you and hearing um, just a little bit about who's in the room, in our virtual room today. Um, so Darren has kindly put together a poll um, to help us see the roles that are represented in the room today. And if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to, to take our poll. It's fun seeing these numbers tick up. I also want to, as you're taking the poll, I want to um, thank all of you for joining us this morning. I know that folks are not all in Washington State, but if you are in the Pacific Northwest, you get like extra, extra credit for coming today because it's a beautiful spring, rare spring day out, outside. And so being inside looking at a computer is, is, um, is admirable. So it looks like we've got lots of preventionists and advocates in the room and a smattering of other roles, folks on campuses, social workers, um, coalition folks, um, education and uh, government folks. And there, hopefully you all can see the results as well. So thank you for taking the time to do that. That helps me. And I, again, I hope that you know, it's fantastic that we have um, a diversity of roles represented here. And my guess is an incredible diversity of um, communities that you work with represented here. And so again, I hope you will share your expertise as we move forward. So just to give you a sense of where I hope we can head today, um, we'll start out by just getting ourselves on the same page around some definitions and terminology. What are risk and protective factors? What do we mean by primary prevention? Um, my guess is that that's pretty familiar territory to many of you, so we'll do that quickly. And then the bulk of the time today, I'd like to quickly review kind of particularly important risk and protective factors that have emerged from the research literature. And um, we're not going to, because there are many risk and protective factors that have bubbled up um, over time, we're going to try to focus on ones that are particularly salient to the work that you do um, or that have a lot of research evidence underneath them. And we're going to be focused on research coming out of the United States. Um, but here and there, I think we'll also try to pull in some global research as well. Um, 
We are also, we know that many of the risk factors we'll talk about today are related not just to sexual violence perpetration, but to other forms of aggression and violence as well. And the Centers for Disease Control have provided a lot of leadership around making some of those linkages explicit. And so I know that many of you do work not just in sexual violence, but also dating violence and intimate partner violence and bullying. And so we'll try to highlight factors that are shared underneath some of these forms of violence. Um, and then at the end, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to talk about, you know, given the number of things we could focus our prevention programming on, how do we think strategically about how to prioritize risk or protective factors that we focus on in our work? Um, and again, I'm going to put in another plug <laughs> for you to share your expertise as we go, so both in terms of questions um, and in terms of um, adding your, your knowledge to the discussion. I do want to just um, highlight the fact that we're going to mostly focus on risk factors for sexual violence perpetration here, um, and specifically um, perpetration by men. So most of the research that's available looks at male perpetration of sexual assault, um, and because sexual assault is disproportionately perpetrated by men, that will be our focus today, um, knowing that that certainly does not cover the waterfront of um, sexual assault perpetration and potential risk factors. So we're going to move right into quickly covering a little bit of vocabulary, which again, I'm guessing is familiar territory to many of you. Um, we're, when we talk about risk and protective factors, we're talking about concepts that come out of public health. And as you know, risk factors are characteristics, behaviors, experiences, beliefs, attitudes, um, different factors that increase the likelihood that a specific outcome or a specific problem or a specific behavior will develop over time. So in this case, we are talking about factors that increase the likelihood that someone will engage in sexually aggressive behavior as an adolescent or an adult. Um, risk factors don't necessarily directly cause the problem or the behavior, um, and not all people with a specific risk factor will develop that problem or behavior. So kind of like not all people with high cholesterol will um, end up having a heart attack. Um, but the more risk factors someone has or is exposed to can increase the likelihood that a particular behavior like sexually aggressive behavior will develop. On the other hand, uh, protective factors are things that specifically buffer risk factors. So they are, again, experiences or assets or strengths or traits that kind of reduce the power of risk factors in creating the likelihood that a problem will occur. So as you know, prevention then is, is um, largely about sort of trying to um, address and reduce risk factors and bolster protective factors so that on balance the scale is tipped towards conditions in which problematic behaviors or outcomes are um, unlikely to develop in the first place. All right. Um, my guess is that this is a very familiar picture to you all as well. This also um, comes from a lot of leadership from the Centers for Disease Control and is a model that comes out of public health and community psychology. So you're looking at the social ecological model just as a reminder that these risk and protective factors that we talk about exist at all levels of the environment around individuals. So certainly risk and protective factors can reside within individuals, people's experiences or beliefs or attitudes or characteristics. Um, but these risk and protective factors are also in folks' families and social networks and their relationships. Um, as well as the institutions that, that folks interact with, our schools, workplaces, human service systems, can all have embedded in them factors that either um, facilitate or allow sexual violence to continue, um, or that, that hinder it or buffer it or um, support respectful, healthy relationships. Um, risk factors can also happen and exist in our community in larger, um, larger societal contexts. So social norms, social policies, um, larger social inequities and oppression and discrimination all create larger conditions in which sexual violence can happen, um, which I know 
that you are all really familiar with. So a lot of times research tends to focus more kind of at the individual and that social network or interpersonal relationship level. And so you'll see us focusing a little bit more on that today. But we're going to make those linkages to those larger social inequities and social norms that both create the conditions in which sexual violence can occur, um, that fail to stop it, that reflect individual attitudes and beliefs um, and support individual attitudes and beliefs that, um, are con that can place folks at risk for behaving in sexually aggressive ways. And I'm hoping that you will also help me make those linkages as we go forward. So right away, before we actually kind of dig into some of the literature, I know that you all know a tremendous amount about risk and protective factors, and particularly the risk and protective factors you see in the communities that you work with, or the schools that you work with, or kind of the local groups that um, your prevention programming um, is intended to support. And I'm, I'm hoping you'd be willing to spend a few minutes in the chat box um, sharing a little bit about what you see as the most important risk factors or protective factors um, for folks in the communities that you serve. So those could be individual level beliefs and attitudes that you see. Those could be things in your um, institutions or social networks. Um, I'm wondering if we could just take a couple minutes to brainstorm here, and I will do my best to, to monitor the chat and sort of share what, share what folks are sharing. So I'm seeing some protective factors, good family communication, um, relationships with parents and children. Um, on the other side, I'm seeing risk factors, acceptance of violence, and lack of accountability, um, socioeconomic status, substance use, toxic masculinity, lack of comprehensive sexual education in school, entitlement. This is great. Now I'm starting to have trouble keeping up with all the fantastic ideas that are, are being up, <laughs> coming up here. Uh, gender inequities, rape myths. Um, on the protective side, teaching respect and healthy boundaries. Social media as a vehicle, perhaps both for risk and protective factors. A lack of support. This is fantastic. Keep them coming for a few more seconds here. I know typing takes a little bit of time. So risk factors, prior exposure, um, so potentially adverse childhood experiences, um, teachers ignoring rape comments, so rape myths or rape supportive attitudes, um, lack of access to education about these issues, on the protective side, constructive male engagement, teaching skills that support healthy relationships. These are fantastic. I'll give you a couple more seconds here. Social norms that normalize some forms of sexual harassment, intergenerational trauma, uh, protective factors encouraging autonomous sexuality beginning in youth. These are great. So, Clearly, I am. I'm just. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, impressed by the the list that you're generating, by the expertise in the room, and as you're starting to see here, you've already developed um, a really lengthy list of protective factors and risk factors, um, and you've, in large part. Uh, anticipated much of what we are going to talk about today. So you've done the work for us already here in this webinar. Um, so this is fantastic. And because this is such a big list, it raises the question of all of us have resource limitations, all of us have staffing and time limitations. And so at some point we have to prioritize. We can't address every single risk and protective factor that we know um, is live in our communities and that the research would say that we might want, be wanting to attend to. So we've got to come up with ways to prioritize. Um, and I know that many of you are, um, have long histories of doing prevention. And so as we move forward, I'll be curious to hear from you how, how you go about deciding which kinds of risk and protective factors you're going to most focus on in your programming and what kind of strategic choices you make about that. This can also be an opportunity to sort of think critically about are, is the prevention we're engaging in, are the specific activities we are using in our prevention programming really conceptually connected 
to the risk factors that we most want to address and try to reduce? Do, can we draw a direct link between the prevention programming that we're engaged in and the specific kinds of risk factors that we'd like to see less of in our communities? So thank you for this list, and I also really appreciate the way that you're thinking on multiple levels here. So I'm also seeing sort of larger inequities, fear of police in institutional and community settings um, as, as risk factors, um, fear of not being believed, um, factors in different institutions like churches, schools, and et cetera. So hold on to those ideas. and. Um, as a spoiler alert, many of these are going to come up in a few minutes, so you've nicely anticipated where we're headed. I wanted to do one more piece of framing before we dive into the risk and protective um, factors themselves and just revisit what it is we mean when we talk about prevention. So again, this is likely completely familiar territory to you. Um, but it's important, I think, to, to be clear when we use words about prevention what we mean by those. And there's actually kind of two ways of categorizing prevention. Likely the one that um, everybody is familiar with is the public health conceptualization of prevention, which categorizes prevention kind of in terms of the timing of when prevention happens. Um, so primary prevention, which is our focus today, is about intervening or trying to change risk and protective factors before the problem develops altogether. So in this case, before folks develop sexually aggressive behavior, sexually assaultive behavior. Um, so if we were to think of a different example altogether, if we, were, if we were about the business of, for example, preventing car crashes, primary prevention would look at the risk factors for car crashes and change those risk factors. So it would do things like enforce speed limits and improve road conditions and run driver safety programs and public education about um, drunk or distracted driving. It would try to stop car crashes from, hap from ever happening in the first place. And that's our focus today, thinking about how do we get in on the ground floor before um, the inclination or the ability or the, the um, tendency um, to use sexually aggressive behavior ever starts for folks. Secondary prevention is intervening once the problem has started to, to develop, to try to intervene early to minimize the impact of that problem. So again, if you go back to car crashes, secondary prevention might be things like seat belts or airbags in cars. They're not going to stop the car crash, but they're going to make the impact of that event less bad, essentially. Um, and then tertiary prevention is, um, is really treating the problem after it has fully developed. So it's more of kind of the treatment stage of things. So our focus today is on primary prevention. How do we reduce risk factors and bolster protective factors in a way that reduce the likelihood that sexual violence happens at, at all to begin with? Um, the other way of categorizing prevention is, is about the audience and who is exposed to that prevention work. Um, and this comes from the Institute of Medicine who categorizes prevention also um, kind of helpfully in three categories. And the first is um, universal prevention. And universal prevention is something that everybody gets, everybody in the general population gets. So it might be a curriculum that everybody in the school is, um, an anti-bullying curriculum that everybody in the school is exposed to. Or it could be um, public service campaigns that everybody with access to radio or television is exposed to. Um, so often primary prevention is targeted universally and everybody has the opportunity to hear those messages. Selected prevention from the Institute of Medicine's perspective is um, targeting prevention at folks who have some risk factors for the problem, but they haven't yet developed the problem. So you could still do primary prevention with a selected audience. So for example, if you're working on college campuses, you might kind of prioritize your resources to address higher risk groups on campus and work perhaps a little bit more with Greek systems on campus. Um, or a, another example might be that um, primary prevention with selected audiences might be geared towards youth who have some risk factors, youth who have experienced early forms of maltreatment, um, but, have not, but who, who are not in, engaging in sexually aggressive behavior. And then indicated prevention is, again, more treatment, working with folks who've developed the problem. So I, I would just, um, I'm guessing that many of you do primary prevention, but um, I'll just pause there for a moment for you to sort of think about where, where do your prevention efforts 
lie where are they targeted? Um, and is that with universal populations or is it with more kind of um, prioritized or selected populations? I'll just pause. Do folks have questions or things they would add here? All right. As we move forward, again, our focus is going to be on primary prevention. Um, but I'll encourage you to think about and, and share with the group sort of how risk and protective factors um, may help us think about, given all um, where, where our, our priorities lie, and if we can use sort of the indicated, or the, sorry, the universal selected and indicated way of uh, categorizing prevention, how does that then help us prioritize some of the most important risk and factor, protective factors to target? All right. So we're going to move into a brief uh, overview of what some of the research literature says about risk and protective factors. And again, I'm pulling directly from a report that um, the Department of Health asked um, our evaluation group to put together about this time last year. So I want to give a shout out to Kristen McFarland, Kristen McFarland and the Department of Health for um, supporting that work. And um, this was part of a larger effort in Washington State to kind of um, continue to think on how we do statewide prevention evaluation. And the ask was to do an update of what research has been saying about kind of the most potent risk and protective factors for sexual violence perpetration. Um, and we were a little strategic about how we went about that. Um, I worked with my colleague Tatiana Masters. And we drew from two other recent reviews that have taken place, one from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control here in the U.S., did a comprehensive review of risk and protective factors in 2012. And so we looked mostly at what research has said since then in addition to that review. Uh, we also looked at a review of sexual offending against children and risk, fact risk and protective factors for that that came out in 2008 by Whitaker and colleagues. So we'll look both at risk and protective factors for peer-to-peer -peer adolescent and, sexual, and adult sexual assault, um, as well as risk and protective factors for child sexual abuse offending. Um, right now in Washington State, we also have uh, programs who are doing really amazing um, sexual violence prevention work in some community-specific groups. And so we also took a little bit deeper dive into some of the, what the literature is saying about risk and protective factors in three specific communities, um, LGBTQ plus communities, Latino, Latina communities, and Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander communities. Um, what we know about research in the U.S. generally is that it is disproportionately inclusive and reflective of mostly white folks and oftentimes um, college-enrolled en white folks, um, and so much of our knowledge about risk and protective factors is mostly reflective um, of those people. And, and so um, a limitation, certainly, of the research that's available to us is that it's, it doesn't always include voices and experiences um, of all of our communities. And I also recognize that by looking a little more closely at these three additional communities, we're still leaving out um, huge, huge communities in the U.S. and we're, we're not getting close to the fully intersectional approach to thinking about sexual violence prevention um, that we need to be. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge those limitations as well, um, as well as the fact that there's an incredible heterogeneity in these communities as well. And so what the research offers is, is some pretty big kind of generalizations about um, what might be particularly important risk and protective factors to focus on that may or may not be completely relevant for all the communities that we're working in. So I want to acknowledge that right up front as well. Just a few more framing things before we jump straight into the risk and protective factors. Um, again, we're going to focus mostly on perpetration, um, a little bit more on peer-to-peer -peer assaults against adults and adolescents. Um, that's a little bit more reflective of just what the literature has to offer. Um, 
when the CDC did their 2012 review of risk and protective factors, they looked at 67 different risk factors that studies have looked at over the last 20 years. And of those, they found that um, 35 were really pretty consistently related to sexual assault perpetration across the studies that looked at them. And that's a ton of, of risk factors to cover, and way too many to cover today. So again, I've tried to highlight ones that have a lot of evidence underneath them or that seem like they're particularly relevant to the prevention work that's happening across communities. Um, and some of, and I also did a little bit of, of clumping of these. Um, so some of the risk and protective factors that you identified in your impressive list earlier are really important and may not show up in the next few slides, but I invite you to kind of keep those in the forefront as, as we think about um, strategies. So um, what follows is a quick overview of six risk factors and two protective factors. And I'm going to just briefly define each and um, talk a little bit about both the kinds of violence that those risk factors um, support, um, as well as the evidence kind of across some of the community-specific groups that we looked at in the, the literature. Um, the, the data on each slide is supported by lots of different studies. And instead of cluttering up those slides with lots of citations, I just made them kind of more generic. But at any time, if you have a question about where information is coming from, or if you'd like to chat later about some of the specific studies that are included in this review, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. All right. So risk factor number one. Probably not a surprise. Many of you anticipated this in your brainstorm. Um, adverse childhood experiences across literature has been shown to be a pretty consistent um, predictor or risk factor for the development of later um, aggressive behavior um, and also for vulnerability to victimization, and along with a, a number of other health and mental health outcomes. Um, this Risk factor sits also underneath other kinds of aggression, including bullying and dating violence and IPV, a risk for suicide. And um, as the literature about early childhood maltreatment and its relationship to aggression has progressed, um, one of the things that we've learned more about is that, um, in particular, polytrauma or experiencing multiple forms of early abuse um, creates the greatest risk. So experiencing physical abuse and sexual abuse and um, potentially witnessing intimate partner violence. Um, and this risk factor also shows up for in studies that have looked specifically at Asian American and Hawaiian Asian men, um, as well as among Latino men. And it's also important to note, though, that the vast majority of folks who've experienced some kind of maltreatment in childhood do not go on to use aggressive behavior. And there's a pretty significant chunk of folks 30 to 50 percent, depending on the study that you look at, of people who use sexual assault, assaultive behavior who do not have histories of child maltreatment. So clearly this is a powerful risk factor, but by no means kind of a done deal or the only risk factor. Um, and this can, for folks doing sexual assault work in their communities, it, it may be sort of beyond the scope of what you have access to, to work on the primary prevention of child abuse. But this may be a place where um, we can think about strategically uh, prioritizing risk factors in terms of doing selected prevention with young people who've had some traumatic experiences, both to buffer those traumatic experiences, um, but also to reduce the likelihood that over the long haul, those translate into aggressive behavior or increased vulnerability to victimization. All right, so I warned you I'm going to go through these quickly, and we're about halfway through our webinar, so I'm going to speed up just a tiny bit. We've got five more risk factors and two uh, protective factors to go. The next one will also come as no surprise to, to you. We, many of you anticipated this in your brainstorm, um, particularly for peer-to-peer -peer sexual assaults among adolescents and adults, um, gender socialization, rigidly held gender roles, um, and this construct we call hostile masculinity is re a really consistent um, correlate um, of sexually aggressive behavior. 
And so what we mean by that is that for folks who really subscribe to or endorse this kind of dominance-based or sort of quote-unquote traditional notion of masculinity um, are more at risk for using aggression, especially when those ideas about what it means to be a man or what it means to embody masculinity are coupled with or paired with this idea of devaluing women or being suspicious of women and girls or having hostility um, or disdain for women of girls, women and girls. Um, and those are really consistent um, predictors of sexually aggressive behavior. And that has held up um, in kind of general population studies as well as um, studies with um, Asian American and Hawaiian Asian men. And um, so this, this might be an important one to, to really think about targeting and prevention, and prevention activities. And I know many of you do that in, in lots of creative ways. And in fact, there's emerging research and increasing research globally that suggests that when programs include what are called gender transformative components uh, in, in, the, in their curriculum or in their prevention approaches, um, that those kinds of programs may actually have the most promise and the most, um, some of the most effectiveness in terms of shifting attitudes and beliefs and, and behavior related to domestic violence, intimate partner violence, dating violence, and, um, and sexual violence. And what I mean by gender transformative are opportunities within curricula to really talk about, to surface and unpack and think critically about um, participants' ideas about masculinity and femininity and gender itself and gender roles and how um, those messages are transmitted and how those, um, how those ideas are constructed. So when we give people an opportunity to really take a, little, a critical look at where did I get these ideas about what it means to be a man, what it, what it means to be a woman, that that um, holds particular promise for um, effective primary prevention. All right. Risk factor number three is also something that you all anticipated. So um, this is kind of a cluster of risk factors, but in general, attitudes that um, are accepting of violence, attitudes that, in the case of sexual violence, um, minimize the impact of sexual violence, justify sexual violence in some cases, or um, blame the victim or try to hold the victim culpable in some way for assaults that they experience. Um, that these are, um, are consistently related to risk for sexual aggression as well. Um, and, and this is one of the places where there's a lot of interplay between larger social norms and social inequities and discrimination and oppression and kind of the individual level manifestations of risk factors. So rape myths is often the way that we talk about um, these attitudes and beliefs. Rape myths are ideas that try to justify or um, excuse or um, minimize sexual violence. And, and these beliefs are often racialized and translate racial stereotypes that particularly target women of color. Um, so for example, I have a colleague here at the University of Washington Tacoma who does a lot of work, Carolyn West, who does a lot of fabulous work around um, the ways that black women are portrayed in media and pornography and look at the ways that um, African American women are depicted as hypersexualized. Um, and thus not quote unquote rapeable or um, needing of support around sexual assault. And so as we think about the particular rape supportive beliefs that exist in each of our communities, um, it's important to unpack kind of what are, what are, the, um, what are the really live beliefs around entitlement or racial stereotypes or about girls or women that are driving this um, kind of uh, minimization of sexual assault or blaming of victims um, in our specific community contexts. There's also some emerging evidence, this kind of exciting research that has just started coming out in the last few years, that look not only at what are the things that predict who's going to become sexually aggressive, but that follow sexually aggressive folks over time and look at the factors that predict who's going to stop being sexually aggressive. And this is really new research, and so it's a little bit tentative. Um, but some of the factors that, um, that differentiate people who keep offending from those who stop include 
um, victim-blaming attitudes or rape-supportive attitudes, also gender roles. Um, so that gives us a hint about what might be some of the most powerful risk factors to target that um, are associated with, with behavior change, and, and this may be one of them. All right, so I am noticing that I've been totally neglecting the question box here, and um, so I'm going to try to circle back and just quickly address a couple questions to the extent that I can. And Rebecca, hello. You asked, um, do you know of gender transformative programs for parents to talk about raising children um, with this as a guiding principle from a young age? And that is such a fantastic question. And off the top of my head, um, I, I don't know which programs include strategies for parents to talk with children. I think that is embedded in some of the, the programming, particularly coming out of um, agencies like Promundo or Sanke. Uh, Promundo in, in, is an international organization, but it started in Brazil, Sanke in South, South Africa. Um, but I would have to do a little investigation and get back to you about um, other potential curricula that include that as a component. So many of, many of those curricula offer participants the opportunity to identify their own beliefs about gender, um, but it's a great question about the extent to which that extends, extends to parenting and conversation. So I'm guessing there's some expertise in the room about that. Um, and I, did I miss any other questions? Um, Rachel, you asked what's the difference between intimate partner violence and dating violence. That's also a great question. Um, so as in some of the literature that I'm drawing from and the, the literature that the CDC offered, um, dating violence was more about um, um, kind of adolescent or younger adult dating um, and particular risk factors for that as opposed to um, kind of intimate partner violence among adults and across the broader lifespan. All right, so hopefully that helps. So I'm going to move on to our fourth risk factor here. We've got three more risk factors to go and two protective factors. Um, our fourth risk factor, many of you also anticipated, and um, has to do with thinking about kind of the, the interplay between sexual health promotion and sexual violence prevention. And there are folks in Washington State that are doing fantastic work around, um, around that interconnection. But one of the risk factors that shows up a lot in in literature is that for some men who have kind of a scoring or one-upsmanship or um, kind of non-intimacy-based non approach to sex in which numbers of sexual partners are, are kind of prioritized over emotional or intimate or romantic connections with partners, um, for some men that um, is a risk factor for sexual aggression. And particularly when um, a kind of impersonal approach to sex is coupled with that notion of hostile masculinity or really rigid adherence to gender roles. Those two things together um, are one of the primary pathways through which um, sexual violence, risk for sexual violence can develop. Um, and that combination of risks was, um, was kind of pointed out or, or clarified in the confluence model of sexual aggression, which has been around um, now for a good 25 years ago, 25 years or so, it was created by Neil Malamuth at the University of um, California, Los Angeles, and um, is I think a helpful way of thinking about not just risk factors, but the way risk factors actually interact with each other to exacerbate risk. So certainly there are lots of folks who have very active sex lives and with lots of partners that, that um, are consensual and respectful um, and um, and not a risk for sexual aggression. And so it's really this combination of kind of an uncaring approach to sex with rigid gender roles or a disdain for women and girls that can create this risk. And that, as many of you pointed out in your chat, is an argument for integrating sexual health promotion and sex positive work and um, comprehensive sexual health education into our prevention efforts. Um, so that folks have a comprehensive understanding of consent, um, and folks have um, a comprehensive understanding of their own sexuality and desire and ways of, of, of navigating those in respectful, consensual ways. All right. Risk factor number five. We're going to move a little bit more to 
the kind of interpersonal social network level. And another really consistent risk factor that emerges from the literature is being in a peer group or a social network in which you perceive that your friends are okay with using coercion or force or alcohol or other substances to gain sexual access uh, to women and girls. And um, particularly when um, young men feel a lot of pressure to engage in sexual activity or they believe that their male friends engage in sexually aggressive behavior, this creates risk for sexual aggression. Um, this is a, one of the strongest and kind of can most consistently documented risk factors for sexual aggression. And it's made worse by the fact that it turns out that young men are not especially great at actually estimating the degree to which their friends care about consent. Um, young men tend to underestimate, research shows that young men underestimate how much their friends care about consent and respectful relationships. They tend to overestimate how much sex their friends are having. And so not only is it a problem when young men believe that their friends are okay with coercive approaches to sex, um, they actually overestimate the extent to which their friends think that. So um, um, so we, we both need to kind of target the beliefs themselves, but this then becomes the conceptual basis for social norm campaigns, which I know many of you use, and the need to kind of educate peer networks and social networks about actual levels of uh, norms for respect and egalitarian relationships um, that exist. All right. Our last risk factor um, has kind of an unfortunate title. This is what the research calls it. Um, this, this risk factor did not show up in the, the 2012 CDC review, um, but essentially minority stress is kind of the impact of being part of a marginalized group that is subjected to discrimination, negative stereotypes, um, large and small max, uh, aggressions, and this is not a risk factor for perpetration, so we're, we're deviating just a little bit here. Um, but not surprisingly, um, being subjected to um, the impacts of oppression um, creates um, additional vulnerabilities to victimization. And so it's a really important risk factor to include here, I think, as we think about the socio-ecological model of risk and protective factors. And a lot of the literature um, supporting this comes from work with LGBTQ plus youth in particular, and the um, vulnerabilities um, that um, being part of a targeted margin marginalized group um, creates for young people. There's also a tremendous amount of evidence that um, that, that being connected to a supportive community and an affirming community is a protective factor against victimization. And this is true both for LGBTQ plus um, youth and communities. It also um, emerges from research with Latina and Latino communities. Um, the close community ties um, really serve as protective factors and you know, sort of underscores the importance of and in many ways the kind of prevention that Washington State has supported for a long time around really community-driven, community-specific prevention work that, um, that really mobilizes community leadership to marshal the strengths and assets and community ties that um, serve as protective factors within communities. So, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. We've got a few minutes left and two protective factors to cover. Um, so just briefly, um, a protective factor that is a source of resilience across many kinds of, of potentially negative outcomes, including violence, is social support and social connectedness. So there's evidence that um, being a part of families, relationships, peer networks, communities in which folks feel connected, valued, affirmed, um, responsible, um, can be a, a protective factor against some other risk factors. And this is really particularly important. It's important for everybody, um, but it has shown up again and again in research with um, LGBTQ plus youth um, as um, a, a buffer against some of the marginalization and stigmatization that youth can experience. So to the extent that we can think about building in 
relational aspects to our prevention programming, strong relationships with our participants, but also factors that build relationship and connectedness amongst community members that we work with, we're fostering this protective factor. And finally, quickly, um, empathy and the ability to understand other, other folks' emotional state or experience, to understand our impact on other folks um, is a protective factor for multiple kinds of violence. Um, this is a particularly important protective factor for sexual offending against children. Um, folks who offend against children often have um, challenges around both cognitively understanding empathy as well as affectively, emotionally connecting to empathy. Um, and this also may be kind of one of the linkages between that first risk factor that we looked at and risk for sexual aggression. Um, that challenges with empathy um, can sometimes come out of attachment disruptions that happen with early child maltreatment. And so um, fostering social connectedness and fostering empathy can be a buffering um, and uh, a factor for some of those early negative experiences. Phew, so that, those were the ones that I wanted to highlight. I apologize for going through those so quickly. Um, what you see on your screen in a very blur, blurry format here are um, all of the risk factors that the CDC review looked at in 2012, many of which we've actually covered today. But there's many more, and that underscores the need to think strategically about which ones we address um, and which ones we can um, we can think about dealing with synergistically or kind of pushing on synergistically. Um, so I'm curious, you know, we have about 10 minutes left, and I know um, there, there are a couple questions lingering out there, but I'd love to hear just a few thoughts from you about how historically you've decided which risk and protective factors you prioritize in your prevention programming. What, um, what criteria do you use or what strategies do you use to think about um, uh, how you how you choose how you f what you focus on, and I'm just going to pause here for a second and also catch up on on questions that might have have come through. How have you decided which uh, which protective factors or risk factors to focus on? So Anne talks about um, coming from the international development field using gender transformative approaches and social norms tools to diagnose the social norms and maybe re-educate folks about um, actual social norms in communities. Um, Angelo, we had tons of parents that came to us, so thinking about what the community is specifically asking for, that's fantastic. Um, so I'm seeing some themes around um, building coalition and um, working across agencies to think about synergistically addressing risk and protective factors, um, some prioritizing gender. Again, uh, social norms diagnosis. So these are these are are great criteria that are bubbling up here. So I'm seeing a few themes around. Um, engaging in engaging communities themselves uh, in identifying what's most important for them. So this, the notion of nothing for us without us, um, leveraging that expertise or that evidence that that notions of gender particularly drive risk for sexual violence um, as an important criteria for thinking about risk and protective factors. Um, partnering across coalitions and agencies and communities. These are fantastic. So just to be a, um, respectful of time here, I'll offer a couple of other criteria to think about um, as, as you um, think about what role the risk and protective factors we've covered might play in your ongoing prevention work. And again, you've, you have um, nicely anticipated many of these. You know, one of the things we know from the principles of effective prevention is that when we do prevention at multiple levels, or at least more than one level, meaning when we push on risk and protective factors both among individuals but also within social networks or within larger communities, um, we have more hopes that we create attitude and behavior change and, and ultimately social change. Um, so thinking about operating on more than one level is important. 
Uh, but here's four other quick criteria that we might think about. Um, when you have to choose um, your audience, sort of prioritizing um, folks who may be most at risk for vulnerability to victimization or most at risk for developing aggressive behavior um, is one way to prioritize those. And so that might be young people most at risk doing selected prevention um, with those folks around some of the risk and protective factors. Many of you talked about prioritizing factors that are most relevant to your community context and doing some assessment about that, both in terms of what risk factors are most relevant, but then what attitudes and beliefs are embedded in those risk factors that are most kind of closely held by the folks in your communities so that we can talk in community-specific and culturally familiar ways about um, the beliefs that people hold. Another way, another way to prioritize them is to prioritize the ones that are most kind of consistently related to sexual aggression in the literature. And so f of the ones that we just reviewed, those might be things like rigid gender roles, um, perceived social norms about acceptance for violence, um, rape myths. Those are also, not coincidentally, some of the factors that have started to distinguish between folks who continually to use sexual aggressive behavior and folks who have behaved in sexually aggressive way sexually aggressive ways but have stopped. Um, and lastly, to pick risk factors that sit underneath more than one type of violence. Um, so things like acceptance of violence, early childhood maltreatment um, sit under multiple forms of violence including bullying, intimate partner violence, and so we can be strategic by selecting those risk and protective factors that have some hope of reducing not just sexual violence but other forms of aggression as well. So um, those were the thoughts I was hoping to share. Um, I want to thank all of you. We have a few minutes left for questions, so I'm going to pop over into the question box and, um, and see if there's any un unanswered questions. But I hope folks will continue to add their expertise or post their questions if they have them. So Rebecca, you posed the question, is there a connection with risk factor number six to say that internalized privilege and entitlement can lead to increased perpetration? Um, that's a really great question. You are asking really good questions today, Rebecca. That I'm not doing an awesome job of, of answering because yes, indeed, there's you know, a ton of research that supports that notion for gender and gender-based entitlement. Um, I'm guessing that there is research around attitudes around white supremacy and other forms of, of entitlement, um, but I'm not familiar with that specifically around sexual violence. So I think that's a really great question. Um, any other questions or parting thoughts before we, before we close today? So Jenna asks, I get questions from high schools about education they can use with students who have shown predatory behavior on other students. What are your thoughts about utilizing primary prevention education versus offender treatment models? Um, and Jenna, continuing in the tradition of Rebecca, you've asked a question that I don't know that I am sufficiently steeped in sort of um, tertiary prevention and treatment to answer. Um, I know that this is a struggle on college campuses as well to think about you know, to what extent do primary prevention approaches work with some of the folks who have been adjudicated. I, I do know there's some literature that suggests that some of the primary prevention we do, at least on college campuses, works best for folks who are low risk and actually doesn't go all that far with folks who come in with sexually aggressive behavior. Um, and, and so I think, it, I don't know that doing primary prevention can hurt, but I think there's more that's needed for folks, um, which is a very incomplete answer to your question. Um, so I will inv invite um, other folks' um, input on that one as well. Hey, Erin. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, officially wrap up this webinar and in the recording, but I will keep everything going for at least 15 minutes um, if people want to continue chatting in the chat box or if you're able to stick around for questions. I just want to respect people's time and kind of do these last wrap-up messages. Um, 
So there will be an evaluation that shows up when you exit the webinar. We really appreciate people taking the time to, to fill that out. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email verifying your attendance and ongoing training hours. Sometimes that ends up in spam or junk mail, so be sure to check that if you don't see it. Um, if pe multiple people participate in this webinar um, in one computer, please send me an email. My uh, email address is right there on, on your screen, darin at wixap.org. And the recording of this webinar will be available on our website within seven days. So thank you for joining us. Um, like I said, I will be, uh, I'm going to keep this session up so that people can continue to chat and connect with each other. Um, and I'll hand it back over to you, Erin. Thank you, Darren. Um, Sorry, I'm going to stop recording real quick. It might, it might show up a message here. Thank you. Please.